Picture is worth a thousand words. But what do the pictures, monuments, and great art of our nation's capital tell us about American history and our founding fathers? Do these monuments, as many modern politicians would have us believe, tell a secular story? Or do they hold spiritual significance? What happens to a society who forgets the truths and symbols of its own past? And what are the consequences when we do? Discover the forgotten and astonishing story of our nation's foundation in the American Heritage Series. For centuries, Americans were taught a truthful view of history that recognized the godly heroes and moral foundation our nation was founded upon. But in recent years, a new version of history has assaulted the moral and spiritual fiber of our nation, leaving the truth of our past eliminated and forgotten until today. Join historian David Barton and experience the untold story of our nation's history in the American Heritage Series. The Capitol Building of the United States of America. What a majestic edifice. This is one of the very few structures which is recognized the world over. When one sees a picture of this building in virtually any land, they know it's the American seat of government. This grand structure has been the scene of some of the most profound moments in America's history. In its two centuries of use, this building, these walls, these grounds, they've welcomed the voices of some of our greatest heroes. This building has survived some of America's most desperate and foreboding dangers, and some of the most important issues of American life and culture have been decided within these walls. Truly, this building has many diverse stories to tell. There are stories reflecting its architectural heritage, its political heritage, and its artistic heritage. But especially interesting are the stories reflecting its rich spiritual heritage. Many visitors of our nation's capital would be shocked to discover that the faith of our founding fathers has indeed been chiseled in stone throughout our nation's capital. But why has this irrefutable evidence of our great spiritual heritage been covered up and forgotten? Discover our nation's godly history in the American Heritage Series. America, this is your heritage. The U.S. Capitol is absolutely one of the most recognizable buildings in the world. Virtually a citizen of any nation will recognize the U.S. Capitol. In America, we've been taught that that's one of the greatest symbols of secularism that we have in the nation. It's a symbol of secular government. But there's also a room in the Capitol that is significant in itself. There's a room set aside specifically for religious activities. Now, the Capitol itself is filled with religious symbolism and activities and statues. in other ways, statues, artwork, paintings, individuals like John Quincy Adams, Daniel Webster, etc. But there's one room set aside specifically for prayer and worship and Bible reading. There's a really cool congressional prayer chapel. It's a fairly small room. It's not very large. I know many members of Congress and, and I talk to them regularly and so many will go in there and spend time praying and seeking God. And it's really cool because there's, there's a kneeling bench there. You go in and you can kneel down and in front of the kneeling bench is an open scripture so you can turn to whatever passage you want. And that, that open Bible is laying on an altar that is directly in front of a huge stained glass window. And the stained glass window is George Washington kneeling in prayer. He surrounded in the stained glass all the 50 states are, are around him. And then it's got Psalm 16:1 around him that says, that, that we put our trust in thee, in thee, O Lord, do I put my trust. So it's a great setting. I mean, but it's a tiny room. It's only got six chairs in the room. And that room really does get actively used today. I mean, they've had that room there, but people take their faith very seriously. Wow. And this is one of the difficulties we have in the way we look at Washington, D.C. and government today. We think it's secular, and the media keeps telling us it's secular, and they only show us people that are secular. There is a room here at the Capitol which honors the faith of George Washington and which reflects the George Washington of a pre-revisionist era. That room is the Congressional Prayer Room, located just off the main rotunda. This prayer room was opened in 1954, the same year in which Congress added the phrase, under God, to the Pledge of Allegiance. This room is actively used today and therefore is not open to the public so that it will always be available to those congressmen who want to use this room to pray and seek God. In the front of this room is an inspirational stained glass window 
portraying George Washington kneeling in prayer, a position that, according to Washington's friends and observers, was a frequent prayer posture for George Washington. Above his picture is the declaration, this nation under God, and surrounding Washington is the Bible verse from Psalm 16:1, declaring, preserve me, O God, for in thee do I put my trust. You're not talking about the church that no. you visited on Sunday. That's right. You're talking about a chapel inside of the U.S. US Congress. Congress. That's right. <laughs> okay. And, I can't believe it. And that. this little room, th th these guys, we don't know most of the congressmen. We think we do. Um, there's 435 people elected to the House. There's 100 elected to the Senate. If you'll think back over the people you've seen from Congress on TV in the last two years, you'll name five or six or seven. Right. And as you look at them, you say, eh, I'm not real interested in those guys. There's no difference between anybody in Congress. We've seen 5% of who's there. You know who we don't see? The really dedicated, godly, God-fearing guys committed to their faith. Mm -hmm. And as an example, I was talking with the leadership, and, and the leadership had a vote that they needed everybody on. It's one of these party line votes that you need everybody from each party on their side. To, and typically when you have a vote in Congress, they leave the vote open for 15 minutes. If you're in leadership, you can leave it longer, open longer if you want to or shorter if you want to. It's your, your call but typically 15 minutes. Well, this was a very crucial vote, and came time for the vote to end, and there's a bunch of folks that haven't been in to vote yet. I mean, a bunch of folks, and that doesn't happen in Congress. And so they say, where are these guys? And so they start sending runners out over the office building, see if they're over there, see if they're in this meeting hall, see if they're in, in this committee. Couldn't find them. Turned out 60 of them were packed in this little congressional prayer chapel praying about how they should cast their vote. What did God want them to do in this vote that they were about to cast? And that, that congressional prayer chapel only has six chairs in it. You get 60 people crammed in there. I mean, you're wall-to-wall -wall bodies. Wow. You get 60 congressmen in there praying, asking God how they should cast their vote. There is now a special room set aside in the Capitol, aside from the prayer chapel, it's a much bigger room, into which they all cram. So every week before they cast their votes, they go in there and say, God, what do you want us to do? I, I want to vote the way you awesome. want us to vote. When the House met here in the old chambers, many famous statesmen conducted their deliberations for the nation right here. In fact, there are bronze plaques embedded in the floor showing the locations of the members of the House who also became presidents. These include James Buchanan and Millard Fillmore. And Abraham Lincoln sat over here as a young congressman. Incidentally, President Lincoln has been honored with a statue in the rotunda. Also identified in this room are the locations where Andrew Johnson, Franklin Pierce, James K. Polk, and John Tyler had their desks. And the venerable John Quincy Adams had his desk right over here. You may recall something of the remarkable story of John Quincy Adams. He grew up during the American Revolution, and by the age of eight, he could perform musket drills with precision. And he had proven so at the command of the famous Massachusetts Minutemen who had often visited his father's house. John Quincy Adams was too young to soldier, but he did end up serving overseas during the Revolution. At the amazing young age of 11, he was assigned the task of being secretary to his father, John Adams, America's ambassador to the British court of St. James. And at the still tender age of 14, he was appointed to be the official diplomatic secretary to Francis Dana, America's ambassador to Russia. After the Revolution, John Quincy Adams was appointed as an American ambassador by President George Washington, who called him, quote, the most valuable public character we have abroad, end quote. John Quincy continued to hold foreign assignments until the presidency of Thomas Jefferson when he became a U.S. Senator. Under President Madison, John Quincy Adams returned to foreign diplomacy. Under President Monroe, he became Secretary of State, and following Monroe, John Quincy Adams became our president. After finishing his presidency, John Quincy Adams was elected to serve here as a member of the House of Representatives, becoming the only president ever to serve in Congress after his presidency. Actually, this simple fact distinguishes John Quincy Adams from the other presidents honored in this room. They went from the House to the presidency, whereas John Quincy Adams went from the presidency to the House. John Quincy Adams became a member of this house in 1831, and he served here until he met his death in this very room in the midst of his congressional duties in 1848. 
Many visitors of our nation's capital would be shocked to discover that the faith of our founding fathers has indeed been chiseled in stone throughout our nation's capital. But why has this irrefutable evidence of our great spiritual heritage been covered up and forgotten? Discover our nation's godly history in the American Heritage Series. America, this is your heritage. You're opening our eyes. You're giving us a glimpse of the foundation of really what we are built upon to a foundational principle of what we are. And it's, it's putting a vision inside of us yeah. that we'll see that again. And, you know, and that's such a good point because if we were to start doing now what we did for hundreds of years in America, we'd be considered radical. Right. You know, if, if we started having another church service in the Capitol, why, that's unconstitutional. Wait a minute, Thomas Jefferson's the one who starts this back at the beginning, and Madison and all these guys that we call constitutional experts. I mean, we're, we're so used to thinking that government is all secular, that the Capitol building is all secular. And in addition to the activities we had there, we had some really super Christian statesmen do some remarkable things there. Mm. You know, we had the Daniel Websters, and, and Daniel Webster did so much in, in relation to Christian faith. But a guy that, that I've even mentioned with the church service is John Quincy Adams. But nobody looks at his Christian convictions as a statesman inside that capital. Yeah. But when he was elected to the U.S. House of Representatives, he went into the House as an anti-slavery guy. He hated slavery. He wanted it to end. Um, his nickname became the Hellhound of Abolition. It's, I mean, he's a bulldog. He got his teeth in this, wouldn't let it go. And as he got into the House, he said that at that point in time in, in American history, he said that roughly 80% of the House should have been anti-slavery, but they weren't. They were pro-slavery. They said, oh, that's a moral issue. We, won't, we, we don't want to deal with moral issues. Oh, that's controversial. Oh, that'll create a ruckus back in my constituent. Same kind of stuff we hear today. Yeah. Sure. Well, he walks in with a lot of courage and conviction, said slavery is wrong, and I'm going to stop it. Well, he came in on Monday, and Monday in the House of Representatives, that the First Amendment of the Constitution says that the citizens have a right to petition their government for re redress of grievances. And on Mondays was petition day in the House. So, Matt, Laura, if you guys said, we want a bill passed on a certain issue, you could take a, a a napkin from a restaurant, write out what you want and give it to your congressman. On Monday, he would submit it to Congress because that's a petition from the people. So he would submit it to Congress. They would look at that. They would assign it to the committee to see if they should do something with it. Well, he walked in one Monday morning with stacks of anti-slavery petitions. Well, it's a pro-slavery house, and they're not real interested in having all these hearings on anti-slavery. So they did then what they still do in Congress today, they used the Rules Committee. And that's an appropriate way to do it, but what they did is they went to the Rules Committee and they came out with a new rule to guide the House. And the new rule said, Monday is still petition day in the House, and on Monday you can introduce any petition you want to, just so long as it's not an anti-slavery petition. Oh my goodness. Well, they called it the John Quincy Adams gag order, designed to shut him up, we're going to stop this dissenting voice. They came in the next week with another stack of petitions. They went through the roof. This went for years. They tried <laughs> censure. They tried reprimand. They tried expulsion. They couldn't shut the guy up. <laughs> Nobody liked him. And talk about a lonely guy in Congress. He eats lunch by himself. Nobody wow. wants to be around him. But he's got these principles. He's not going not, not to change at all. And what happened was after years of this, there was an interview with him. And they said, you know, you've been doing this for years. You're not making progress. You're not winning. Nothing's happening here. Why do you do it? I mean, don't you get frustrated or, or depressed? Or, and he said, no. And they said, why? Here's his answer. He said, I do this because duty is ours. Results are God's. Yeah. Oh, my he said, goodness. I don't do this because of how it turns out. I do it because it's the right thing to do. In the 14th year of doing that, he finally converted enough members of the House to his position. They rescinded the gag order. The House became anti-slavery. They came up with a three-step plan to end slavery, a constitutional amendment that would have ended slavery back in 1843. We would have avoided 600,000 lives being lost. We just didn't have it going in the Senate. But here's a guy who would not quit. He hung in there. He wasn't bitter. He wasn't mean. He just principle-driven. Christian principles drove this guy. And you read his diary, it is unbelievable. John Quincy Adams was not only an outspoken Christian, he was also an avid student of the Bible. He made it his practice to read through the Bible once every year. It is not surprising then that John Quincy Adams wanted his children to grow up knowing the Bible and how to study it. The difficulty with this desire was that during the time that his first son, 
George Washington Adams was growing up, John Quincy Adams was overseas serving as a diplomat. Therefore, John Quincy Adams wrote nine lengthy letters instructing his son how to get the most from a study of God's Word. Those letters were published in this small book, Letters of John Quincy Adams to His Son on the Bible and its teachings. Today, we rarely think of a president as the author of a book on how to study the Bible, but John Quincy Adams was. The circumstances surrounding the death of John Quincy Adams are of particular interest, for death in those days was viewed differently than it is today. Since the scriptures taught in Hebrews 2.15 that one proof of a relationship with Christ was a freedom from the fear of death, observers were interested in how an individual reacted when he faced death. As one political historian in 1854 explained, it is customary, even among Christian people, to hold final judgment of a man's Christian character till it is seen how he makes his death. The manner of a man's death often works a change, sometimes a revolution in public opinion respecting the nature of his life. What then did observers see when John Quincy Adams faced death? For John Quincy Adams, that occasion occurred here in this room on Monday, February 21st, 1848. A local newspaper reporter recorded what transpired on that day. A sudden cry was heard on the left of the chair. Mr. Adams is dying. Turning our eyes to the spot, we beheld the venerable man in the act of falling over the left arm of his chair while his right arm was extended, grasping the desk for support. The speaker instantly suggested that some gentlemen move an adjournment. A sofa was brought in, and Mr. Adams, in a state of perfect helplessness, though not of entire insensibility, was gently laid upon it. On Wednesday evening, February 23rd, at a quarter past seven o'clock, he expired without a struggle. This is the end of earth. I am composed. These were the last words of John Quincy Adams, and he uttered them here in this room, the room in which he died. And this is the couch on which he died. You see here on the wall a bust of John Quincy Adams as a solemn reminder of what occurred here. Today, this room serves as the women's lounge where female members of Congress may come to rest and relax during congressional proceedings. John Quincy Adams comes up with this plan that would end slavery in three steps, and he does this in 1843, 20 years before the Civil War. It doesn't happen. Right. Well, he continues to serve in Congress, and in his last term in Congress, something fairly significant happened. Uh, as he's there, a member of Congress, still fighting against slavery, but now he's converted most of, of at least the House to his position. He ends up dying in midterm of Congress. Mm -hmm. uh, it was in the middle of that session. He was standing up as if he was going to, to make a speech, and he ended up falling over his desk. When he fell over his desk, there were four other members of the House that were physicians came over, and he'd had a stroke, essentially, and ended up dying three days later there inside the Capitol. But in that last term he had in Congress, he only had a half term, but in, in that last time that he had been elected, he's getting new people elected to Congress all the time. He's been there 17 years. Every time there's an election, somebody new comes in somewhere. And one of the new ones that had come in in that election, that, that, that 1846 election, was a young guy. And he came in, he'd run for Congress before, had not been elected, but, but he got there. And for whatever reason, John Quincy Adams really liked this kid and just kind of befriended him and mentored him and, and took him under wing and, and just kind of had a brain dump into him. You know, all the stuff about slavery and how we can end slavery and, and the steps you can go through that would end slavery. And they hadn't been able to get the Senate to do it, but he still got this plan. And so when John Quincy Adams dies, the, this young kid, He's become close enough to that this young kid becomes one of the official pallbearers at John Quincy Adams' funeral. So this young kid ends up running Congress again, doesn't get reelected. So the only time he had in Congress was this, this one year of a two-year term with John Quincy Adams. Next time this kid gets elected was in 1861 as President of the United States. It was Abraham Lincoln. He had one term with John Quincy Adams. And guess what he put into place when he became president? Wow. Same little plan to end slavery. Went through so I many of the same that. things that John Quincy Adams had told him about. So here you've got one generation planning in the next generation. And, and that's really one of the neat features that even mm -hmm. as Christians we need to do. The pilgrims were great on this. They had a stepping stone mentality because in the Mayflower Compact, they said that they came 
for the propagation of the Christian faith. They're, they're gonna get everybody in America converted to Christ. They're so busy trying to stay alive, they didn't get it done. <laughs> they said, but you know, we think that we can be stepping stones for our children. Right. We'll get far enough down the road that maybe they can. And it's kind of that way with John Quincy Adams. Great Christian statesman in, in the Capitol. Remarkable story, but that little bit of time that he had with a young kid named Abraham Lincoln that 15, 20 years later develops into something that finally did put the nail in the coffin of slavery. Something John Quincy Adams would have loved to have wow. seen, but nonetheless, it got done. Many visitors of our nation's capital would be shocked to discover that the faith of our founding fathers has indeed been chiseled in stone throughout our nation's capital. But why has this irrefutable evidence of our great spiritual heritage been covered up and forgotten? Discover our nation's godly history in the American Heritage Series. America, this is your heritage. In 1792, work was begun on the White House. The next year, 1793, construction began on the Capitol. Seven years later, in late 1800, the White House, the Capitol, the Treasury, and other buildings were complete enough that business could be conducted in them. And so Congress moved here into the Capitol as its permanent home. At that time, the adjoining room became the original Senate chamber. The second plaque notes that on November the 22nd, in the adjoining room, President John Adams delivered the first presidential speech ever given in this building. According to the records of Congress, John Adams prayed, May this territory be the residence of virtue and happiness. In this city, may that piety and virtue, that wisdom and magnanimity, that constancy and self-government which adorned the great characters, name it bears, be forever held in veneration. Here and throughout our country, may simple manners, pure morals, and true religion flourish forever. This is quite a prayer for this city and this country, and it was a prayer which occurred next door. Except for a short period of remodeling, the Senate met in these original chambers until 1810 when it moved upstairs into its second home in this building. Those second quarters, located directly above where we're now standing, today are called the old Senate chambers. The Senate remained in those chambers from 1810 until 1859 when the Senate moved into the chambers that it currently occupies. Having noted the three locations in this building where the Senate met, let's also visit some of the locations in this building where the Supreme Court has met. Interestingly, the locations in which the Supreme Court met during its first century and a half form a potent commentary on the Founders' views of the power and the reach of the Supreme Court. Our Founders made remarkably elaborate plans for the city of Washington, D.C. Our Founders planned for traffic. They anticipated growth. They made far-sighted preparations for the President and the Congress and they provided buildings and support services for both. Yet with all of their elaborate preparations, they did not provide a separate building for the U.S. Supreme Court. And this was not an oversight on their part. It was intentional. The Supreme Court met inside the Capitol. In the first 10 years in this building, the court bounced around from location to location, from various committee rooms to library rooms to whatever was available. Then in 1810, when the Senate left its original chambers and moved directly upstairs to its newer and larger second location, the Supreme Court inherited these vacated Senate chambers. It was here in the basement of the U.S. Senate that the Supreme Court finally found its first permanent home, a location it kept for the next 50 years. Then when the Senate vacated the old Senate chambers and moved into its current home, the Supreme Court moved upstairs to possess the again vacated Senate chambers. It was by design that the Supreme Court had no major role in shaping policy in the nation. Simply look at the Constitution for proof. Article I deals with the powers of the Congress, Article II with the powers of the President, and Article III with the powers of the Supreme Court. Article I is by far the longest of those three articles, and Article III is unquestionably the shortest. For the first 10 years of its existence, the entire Supreme Court term lasted less than two weeks out of each year. And for the next 50 years, the court still only met for six to eight weeks a year. It was not until 1935, nearly a century and a half after the founders had written the Constitution, 
that a separate building was built behind the Capitol to house the Supreme Court, the home it now occupies. Dave, after hearing all of this information that you've been giving us, it would lead me to conclude that the judiciary is out of control. We have, unfortunately in America, ceded to the judiciary powers that they were never given. We've allowed them to be the final word over every policy in America. When the Constitution is written, we gave the final word to the people who expressed it through elected representatives that if the representatives didn't do it right, we could throw them out and put more in there to make sure the will of the people. That's why our documents say things like, we the people, consent of the governed. It has now become the judiciary, if you will, an ivory tower elite versus the people. Congress does a pretty good job of siding with the people on most issues, but Congress regularly gets struck down by the judiciary. Now, Congress took the same oath to uphold the Constitution the President took, the judiciary took. The Constitution is a simple document. We start teaching the Constitution in elementary school. So please tell me why only nine people in the United States know what it means. It's such an easy document to read. Wow. What's happened is we the people have said, well, we're going to let these nine guys, the majority of nine, five of them, have the final word for 280 million people, and I guess whatever they say just has to go. No, I'm as capable of reading the Constitution as they are, you are, the President is, the members of Congress probably more so because the members of Congress actually have hearings on issues where that you hear from both sides. You get all sides in, and then you make a decision. They've had more constitutional consideration than those nine justices who only hear one hour of arguments for each case. And for some reason, we have ceded to the court powers that the Constitution doesn't give them, the Founding Fathers definitely didn't give them, that we hadn't given them for 150 years, and now we've decided they get, they get the final word. Part of it's because we don't know our own history. We think that's the way the court's always been. We don't know that we've had a religious her heritage, that we've not been a secular nation, which the court tells us we right. are. We don't know our founding fathers. The court only cites two or three. We have 250. I mean, we've allowed it to happen. But once we figure out what we're about and what the nation's about and what the Constitution actually empowers us to do, we don't have to put up with five people telling 280 million people what their values are going to be. For more information on the American Heritage Series or to find books and other resources, visit wallbuilders.com. Through the American Heritage Series, renowned historian David Barton communicates our nation's forgotten, godly foundations and encourages us to once again view history through a truthful lens. For only when we recognize and embrace God's hand in our history can America become all that it was intended to be. Through Wall Builders, historian David Barton seeks to rebuild the walls of America's unique religious, moral, and constitutional heritage by educating the public and encouraging people of faith to become active in strengthening America's great foundations. For more information on how you can become involved, visit wallbuilders.com.